Hello, OWL members. I'm thrilled to announce this month's Inside the OWL Studio will feature Aura, who has been a supporter of OWL for several years and is one of our uniting sponsors. Aura is one of the world's leading full-service ophthalmic research organizations and has been on the cutting edge of ophthalmic product development for over 40 years, helping their clients earn more than 80 product approvals. They support organizations from startups to global pharmaceutical and device companies to efficiently bring their new products from concept to market. Without further delay, I would like to introduce today's interviewee, Jessica Walker, Senior Director of Operational Strategy at Aura. Jessica is a data-driven marketing life sciences leader and an expert in demand generation, digital marketing, CX strategy, patient engagement, and CRM implementation. Jessica has over 15 years experience leading teams in behavioral health, health information technology, and life sciences organizations. Welcome to Inside the L Studio, Jessica. Thanks, Abby, I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. And as you know, the OWL organization continually strives to create networking and education opportunities to support the mission of advancing diversity and leadership. I find it hugely beneficial to hear from other organizations about their efforts around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. With that being said, I'm very excited to hear from you about Aura's initiatives in this area. So I will hand it over to you now, Jessica. Fantastic. I think that now is, you know, we're at the end of 2023. Um, about to embark on a new year, and Aura is more invested than ever um, in working on diversity inclusion initiatives, not only from a hiring and talent pool perspective um, throughout our organization, but also with the, the research that we do with our patients, the partnerships we have with our sites. Um, so, for example, obviously the FDA guidance from 2022 has really reinforced with our sponsors and with Aura uh, the need to have inclusion across the board um, with clinical research participants. And so as part of our recruitment efforts um, within Aura, we're definitely focused on how do we integrate that? What does that mean for ophthalmolic research? Um, what are the disparate populations that need to be more included depending on what the comorbidities are? Um, where the patients are located to encourage them and to kind of explain the what's in it for me clinical uh, research component. In addition, also the staff initiatives. So we're currently working on diversity and inclusion training. Uh, People Services is doing a tremendous job at kind of getting together the format and the foundation and design of what will be delivered in 2024, uh, not just for our staff in general, but also really focusing on the site staff and the patient interfacing staff, which includes a vast majority of my team, uh, anyone from the clinical research coordinators at the site level um, to the patient recruitment staff that are on the phone that are talking to all of the potential patients that might be interested in research. And so kind of looking at the, the tribalism effect um, having many years in marketing experience, kind of understanding that people that look like us do things like this. And so that being said, having fair um, and expanded representation across different um, ethnic groups, across different geographies in the United States, looking at the more remote areas in which it might be harder to access care, it might be more difficult and challenging to get to a clinical research visit. In addition to also looking at what are the potential job opportunities um, for the staff that we are onboarding at rapid, rapid rates right now um, in uh, preparation for multiple studies that we plan to conduct in 2024 to ensure not just folks that are close to the sites that we have, but also those that have the flexibility and the availability to fly different places in the country um, as part of the job function and, you know, really immerse and embed ourselves into areas that perhaps we haven't been before and expanding into site development relationships with sites that um, are able to offer and support multi-language, that are able to offer and accept, you know, assistance with transportation because it might be a very overly populated area where perhaps Folks driving their cars might not be economical or feasible from traffic perspectives when you arrange transportation um, or say it's close enough to the areas where folks are more remote. So taking all of those factors into consideration, um, those are two very large prongs, um, the focus for us at Aura in 2024. That's amazing, Jessica. And I just love to hear um, the detail that you're putting behind this and the thought you're giving to kind of all the different um, kind of um, nuances that patient care kind of brings brings up. 
um, just the fact that you are considering difficulties in transportation. You know, I, I think that that's a great thing and something that might be an oversight for, for a lot of companies. Um, and I think that's why we do this interview, right? That hopefully other companies that are listening to you today can really say, hey, are we thinking about this? Are we doing what's best for, for patient care um, across the board? Uh, so I wanted to ask you one question because before we kind of summarize here, going into 2024 um, at Aura, what are you most excited about, you know, kind of in that DEI space, something that you feel strongly about that the organization is really doing well, et cetera? Right now, we recently um, made some, some changes within some of our teams and really operationalized and created efficiency within teams in ways that we haven't seen before. We've elevated and acknowledged some really hard work of a lot of leaders in the organization. Many of them happen to be women, <laughs> which I think is fantastic. Oh, yay. <laughs> Many of them happen to be working mothers um, and to see them at the table. And I think that that is tremendous because who's better at multitasking and handling multiple projects and competing priorities than a mother who's trying to take a conference call um, outside business hours and make dinner and has toddlers crying and dogs barking. Um, so I'm very excited to see not only the diversity of gender within leadership positions, um, but also within the organization really attempting to say, where are we going to be doing business in 2024? What kinds of patients are we going to need to recruit for studies based on FDA guidance, just based on sponsor and or as investment to provide a potential point of care um, to lower socioeconomic groups or to groups that are, you know, not located in areas where there is a lot of access to care, where there aren't might be insurance barriers and in gaps and in disparate income situations. Um, because let's face it, regardless of whether it's ophthalmology or a different kind of therapeutic area, um, access to care is a huge issue. Patient navigation of care is a huge issue. And so I think that having an, a, a real clear roadmap that our organization has put forth for next year on how we plan to diversify our workforce um, is going to be really helpful because we need to be able to build trust within the communities in which we work. We need to be able to look at the different things that are impacting their ability to participate in research. So we talked about transportation, but also scheduling is another barrier. We yeah. influence very heavily the design of protocols. And so that being said, we have the autonomy to be able to say, listen, some of these visits are very, very long. Do we need to think about is this going to be feasible if we're going to have however many groups enrolling? Are they going to be able to stay? Are they going to be consistent and fulfill the study ob obligations? Um, in addition to that, the timing. So my team is responsible for yeah. doing the study scheduling coordination, having those evenings and weekends available for folks that don't have childcare, maybe can't take time away from work. So really kind of breaking down the what is possibly inhibiting someone's ability to participate who either one, really has a passion for helping others, or two, really needs assistance themselves to improve their own quality of life. Um, and I think that all of that is really exciting work that our entire team is really devoted to making happen next year and pushing forward. Awesome. Jessica, this is one of the best interviews um, I, I have participated in because in a very short amount of time, um, I've learned a lot and I'm going to probably behind the scenes, pick your brain for several <laughs> reasons, but Please. I, I really, I, I, my takeaway for this and anyone that's listening, um, I, I really think breaking down those barriers is my key takeaway here. And I think Aura does a fantastic job of doing that because they think more they think short term, but more longer term. And what are those barriers? How can we remove them? Um, and at the end of the day, it's all about patient care, right? Um, and making that accessible. Um, so thank you, Jessica. I'm going to go on to our final few questions here, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, what is your favorite word in eye care? Uh, my favorite word in eye care. Uh, can I pick a phrase instead? Sure. I love it. I would say patient outcomes, um, and I'll tell you why. So patient outcomes are so important. It is literally what drives our ability to bring products yep. to market. And what I think is really important too is that sometimes those outcomes aren't favorable. And that is something that sometimes people really shy away from wanting to 
something doesn't work, when something isn't effective, when we might have events that might not um, be what we anticipated or hoped for. But it's so important, one, in research that the patient understands the outcomes aren't always going to be favorable, but two, that we understand those outcomes need to happen in order for us to drive progress forward. So without having something to measure against, without having a study, without having participants, then we can't do the research in the first um, And so that's why I would pick that. I love it. I love it. Um, what would be your least favorite word or phrase in eye care? Probably conjunctivitis, because as soon as my kids contract it, they're giving it to each other and there's time off from school and there's, you know, a period of, <laughs> of being contagious and lots of drops and screaming. So that would be my, my least favorite <laughs> word. It's, it's a word that's actually happening in my house this week. So, <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, hope they feel better soon. Thank you. Um, what professional role would you like to try that you haven't and do not have right now? Specifically in ophthalmology? Yeah, in eye care. I would say probably being a patient navigator, um, which I think kind of sits within my wheelhouse of experience, but also just a passion for helping people understand the process to break down barriers to access to care. Um, and, you know, I can't imagine being burdened with a diagnosis that did not have the potential for favorable outcomes or, you know, long-term quality of life as it pertains to vision, um, that I think that having free access to patient navigation is, is really critical um, and is probably much more sought after than provided in this line of work. I agree. I agree. What, what role would you not like to attempt and why? I would probably have to say I would not want to be the person that is doing the claims and the billing. <laughs> the reason being is because if you're the person that is doing um, all of that really hard work with insurance and with, um, you know, the negotiation of reimbursement, as I would never want to be the person that's being able to tell that's going to a patient and saying it's going to cost you X out of pocket and having that cost mm -hmm. be so significant that it would put a hardship on them that they wouldn't be able to pursue care because um, that would yeah. definitely give me a heavy heart. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you know people, which we all do in, in that role um, and they're very good at it, I think they're also very good problem solvers because yes. generally speaking, there's always a way, you know, if, if, if you're good, um, you can find alternatives, I think. So Absolutely. yeah, I hear you. Um, so one more question before we get to your surprise is <laughs> if you could do one thing to contribute to diverse leadership in our space and eye care, what would it be? I think that it, it starts from the recruitment from the medical school level right, is that to really bring diverse populations to the table to get them to want to participate, um, to have to come up in this profession. So in order for us to be able to look at diversity at Aura with our sites, with our primary investigators and our sub investigators and all of the great clinic staff that help support our studies is really looking at the groups that are led by people of color people that have come up in the industry and are really invested in working with populations that have limited access to care and or who are most afflicted by some of these conditions. Um, so for example, with dry eye, you're going to see a more significant comorbidity specifically with say the Asian population. That's important for mm -hmm. us. To do. And so therefore, when you are working with leaders who are diverse in this space, that's also going to help your patient population with trust, building community, loyalty, et cetera. So that being said, I would definitely say that from the educational level, providing access and, and you know, student loans and making it easier to be able to come up and be an aspiring um, optometrist, op ophthalmologist, surgeon in this space, making it easier for people to pursue their passions um, and provide opportunity is definitely where I think we can make an impact long term. I agree. I agree. And I think you're saying the same thing, but I've always felt that just that awareness of the eye care, the eye health space at an earlier point in people's career is really essential and Absolutely. really yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. So your surprise question for the day is what is a mundane skill or accomplishment you are proud of? Oh gosh. 
I'd say mundane skill. I uh, used to, a couple of years ago, I used to obviously commission someone else to bake the birthday cakes for my children because they would like these elaborate fun cakes. And I am not feeling like I'm a very creative person. Um, and one year I committed to myself that I was going to learn how to properly bake and decorate a cake in a fun way. And so the past two years, I have done a little side project with five of our children um, and I make everybody's birthday cakes and they are whatever it is they want and they're as elaborate as they want. And I will spend way more time than I'd like to admit pouring over fondant and cornstarch and buttercream frosting <laughs> covered in flour in my kitchen. Um, I am not awesome. I am pretty good. Um, but it's definitely something that I've, I've taught my children. I'm self-taught um, that if you put a lot of effort into something, you can certainly improve your skills. And uh, uh -huh. I think I think while they may not always look perfect, the kids know there's a lot of love involved and I get a lot of fun out of it. That's awesome. I love that answer. Oh, that's great. Well, I think that wraps it up for today's Inside the Owl Studio, Jessica. Again, thanks to you and to Aura for all of your support of Owl. This has been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Abby. I appreciate it.